Now we take to the skies for a brand new series. Emily Knight presents Flight of the Ospreys. This year, halfway through April, uh, our mail returned and started building up the nest from there. And as you can see, it's now supporting those two young chicks, six weeks old and only now about, about two weeks until they fledge. So it's been a really good season. And uh, hopefully, just as we're seeing here with the male just bringing in that fish, he'll continue to do that as we see them get older, making sure they don't starve before their long flight, their long migration down to West Africa or maybe Southern Europe. As summer draws to a close, the ospreys of the Scottish Highlands begin a slow and perilous migration south, across the Mediterranean Sea and the Sahara Desert to West Africa. It's a, it's a bit sad when they leave. This year, these beautiful birds of prey won't be travelling alone. Uh, my name's Sasha Dench. I am the founder of Conservation Without Borders, UN ambassador for migratory species, also known as the human swan. In Europe, the ospreys have been very near to extinct in many countries because of human history and human activity, but it is now making a comeback due to human activity. So it has a great story in that with effort and collaboration, we can bring something back. So yeah, the plan is to follow the migration of the osprey, look at the challenges along a flyway through the eyes of one bird. Sasha is a biologist, a conservationist and a fearless adventurer. I first met her when she was transforming herself into the human swan. I just love it. I don't know why more people don't do it. I kind of, it just feels like a bit like a superpower. She strapped an engine and a propeller to her back and flew alongside endangered Buick swans from Siberia to the Severn Estuary, stopping off in towns and villages en route to talk to farmers, hunters and politicians about the threats the swans faced along their migration flyways. She was in search of a fresh challenge when she found herself being spun around a Scottish dance floor. The essence of the idea started at the Scottish Ornithological Conference where they asked me to go and give a talk about the flight of the swans and there was a Cayley at the end of it and uh, whilst Roy Dennis was throwing me around the dance floor at this Cayley, where I'd never done a Cayley before, he said something like, you know, could you do the same thing for ospreys that you did for the swans? I'm Roy Dennis, I'm a field ornithologist and I've studied ospreys since 1960. They're a big raptor, um, as big as a heron, but they're, they're tremendously distinctive in that they hover just above water and then dive in from several hundred feet to grab fish. So they're a specialist at catching fish at the surface of the water. Sasha accepted Roy's challenge and immediately began planning to fly from the Cairngorms to Ghana alongside the Ospreys. Yes, the original plan was that I would fly particularly at key locations where, for example, we could get uh, interesting information from above on the, the state of the wetland, the health of it. You can very easily from above see point source pollution after rain, for example. However, in my current state, yeah, there's no option of flying. On the 18th of September 2021, Sasha was flying her paramotor over the West Highlands. She was involved in a collision with another paramotor flown by her friend Dan Burton, who was filming the trip for a climate change campaign. Both crashed to the ground, Dan died, and Sasha was seriously injured. There was an accident and that involved me falling 150 feet and landing on my legs uh, in a Scottish bog in the middle of nowhere. My lower legs were the kind of crumple zone. And not only can I not fly, I still have some metal framework in my legs, which is going to be in there for the first month of the expedition. The crash had a devastating impact on Sasha and the project as a whole. For Sasha, the expedition has become as much about honouring Dan Burton's legacy as it is about highlighting the threats that the osprey and the other birds of the flyway are facing. Dan, she says, will be with them in spirit. Her physical injuries mean that flying the paramotor is now impossible, so the ospreys will have to be trailed by truck and boat instead. Basically, there's various different bolts and dials all around the frame, which I was able to, over a couple of months, twist to move my tibia down and fill in a gap of bone from the accident. I mean, it's a fairly severe piece of medical equipment. I think you'd be forgiven for just spending the amount of time that you had to wear it, you know, sat on your bum doing absolutely nothing, but you're about to set off on a trip halfway around the world. The surgeons, and I had many surgeons over time, over the last few months, you know, we realised that this metal frame would still be on at the start of the expedition. His first reaction was, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't go anyway. And you're never more happy and enthusiastic 
than when you're talking about the expedition. So the most important thing is that you're doing what you need to do and the frame and the leg and the medical stuff comes second. If Sasha feels able to follow the Ospreys, then we will too. For the next 10 episodes of Flight of the Osprey, we'll be with Sasha, her team and the birds every step of the way. As we head south, we'll be going through uh, Yorkshire and Rutland, which is another key site for reintroduction, and into Wales for a, a site there, and then through Pool Harbour, which is the, the most southerly breeding site, uh, and then down into France, Spain, Portugal, and then crossing the Strait of Gibraltar into Morocco, and from there it's a reasonably coastal route all the way round West Africa and into Ghana. And the Osprey are going to be facing a lot of challenges along the route. What kind of things are making their journey a little bit more difficult? A lot of the wetlands that they use are being challenged by over-extraction or extra-extraction of water. So some of them we know are now much smaller than they need to be to sustain the populations of migratory birds. Collisions and electro electrocutions on power lines in some areas are a challenge. The growth of the Sahara Desert is one of the major challenges for the birds. They've got a big stretch they have to fly. And then for the young birds, I think they have a particularly interesting stories as ospreys migrate on their own as birds. So the young, when they leave their nests in Scotland, uh, will not be shown where to go. So they will try and make their migration south. And according to Roy, he's been looking at this for a long time, because the majority of birds in the UK now have come from a Swedish population, the inbuilt migration pattern has them naturally taking a much more westerly route than they would normally. So if there's strong winds, many of them get blown out to sea. We've talked a little about the kind of challenges the osprey will face as they do this migration. What kind of challenges are you humans going to be facing? Obviously we're going through the same extreme environments. There'll be wet season in some of the countries in West Africa. We are travelling through various countries that are all skirting Mali, which has various levels of, of unrest and higher levels of risk. So we're going to have to make sure that the team are all prepared for that. It's July and just ahead of the Osprey's departure, Sasha's support team have gathered together at Granton on Spey in the shadow of the Cairngorm Mountains to meet in person for the first time and get a refresher course in the kind of survival techniques they might just need. Is he breathing? Yeah. He saw him crash to the ground, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. yeah. So what comes after catastrophic bleed? Airways. My name's Jackie Wilmshurst and I'm um, a psychologist. I'm also ex-military, so I've been involved in hostile environment training for about 10 years now. So Sasha and the team have come here to get some fairly specific training from you guys. What kind of things are you going to be putting them through? The real goal is to make sure that they're very well equipped for the kinds of risks that are the most, the foreseeable risks, and then to sort of match first aid training for some of the scenarios where they might not be able to get medical help. So to be able to stop the sorts of things that can kill someone very quickly. So I'm standing here, I'm the board soldier on the checkpoint. I've probably been here a couple of hours. Suddenly a car approaches. And right now behind us, I think they're familiarising themselves with different kinds of guns. What are they doing that for? We certainly don't want to be um, training people in anything to do with weapons handling or using of weapons, but some familiarity with, for example, the difference between a small handgun and a big assault rifle is useful because if anyone starts using them around them, knowing how to react to sort of minimise the chance of harm is really helpful. Just down the road from where Sasha and the rest of the team are doing their training, is RSPB Lock Garden, which is where I am right now, which has a fairly important role in the history of ospreys in Scotland. After the numbers dwindled in the early 20th century to almost nothing, it was here in the 1950s that the first breeding pair was recorded, heralding the beginning of the return of osprey to Scotland. And if you pop inside the visitor centre, you can have a little peek through their telescopes and see them right there on their nest. Two chicks this year, is it? It is two chicks this year, yeah. And someone who can tell me all about the ospreys is Gareth. Gareth, what's your role here? Uh, yeah, I'm a visitor experience officer here at Abernethy Nature Reserve. And why do you think the osprey here have captured the imagination of the public? It's just the opportunity to see nature so up close, basically. Seeing their characters, seeing them grow up, living with them in a way. An animal that seems quite fierce. It's clearly a predator. Mm -hmm. It's clearly very good at what it does. It's all beak and claws and talons. But seeing it being tender, you know, seeing it feeding its chicks is a nice little insight into a different side of the animal, I think. In some ways, it's like looking at ourselves from the outside in. 
we all you know we all have young to care for we all have um our own personalities and that's what this opportunity is it is that opportunity to see that character and not just see them as they have been labeled uh, as a predator by the 1950s ospreys were effectively extinct as a breeding bird in the uk and their numbers had been decimated along the southern european migration route when three chicks were born at Loch Garten, the RSPB decided to mount a campaign to protect them and raise public awareness of the birds. A young ornithologist was quick to join the team, Roy Dennis. The first time I saw an osprey was in April 1960 when I was a young 18-year-old and uh, I got a job at the RSPB Loch Garten site. We helped to build that number up and now there's about 300, 350 pairs. Ospreys aren't an endangered species worldwide. In fact, the population in Northern Europe has remained largely stable. In the UK and Southern Europe, they've long been persecuted by humans for stealing fish, but it was the Victorians who came perilously close to wiping them out entirely. The craze of egg collections was rife. Uh, so to shoot a pair of ospreys and have them stuffed in your grand house along with their eggs, was what people were after. So that caused this final decline of them. But they didn't go extinct here in Scotland, did they? What did the population get down to at its lowest? It really got down to zero to one. There was a pair nesting in 1916. Every now and then a bird arrived in Scotland and met one that was still here. So, so if you had one pair of osprey and the female was killed on migration, that male could come back for six to eight years hoping that a female turns up and then one spring you get a bird that's been blown over from across the North Sea on its migration to Sweden, lands in Scotland, finds that male and they breed for a few years. But the big difference was that when the pair nested in 1958 the RSPB decided to really put an effort into protecting them and that allowed the population to rise. And these Scottish birds, they are about to set off on a fairly epic migration, aren't they? Well, the females will leave quite soon. The young ones are already, some of them are flying. The female will stay around protecting them. She does no fishing, it's the male does all the fishing. And then really, it's a good idea if she pushes off because then all the fish go to the young. The male will continue feeding the young until the last days of August, early September, and then the oldest young will leave, then the middle one, then the little one, then finally the male. And they all head off independently uh, with genetic knowledge and head for West Africa. And uh, it, it's a hazardous migration. If you're a young osprey leaving Scotland, your chance of survival to come back and breed is, you know, less than half. It's the 27th of July today, and, oh my God, it's my sister's birthday. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. <laughs> and she's in Australia, so they're ahead of us. Damn, okay, she will forgive me. So it's the 27th of July today, and we are leaving on the 1st of August, so that will be a four-month expedition ending end of November. Do you feel ready? Are you excited? It wasn't until we were actually on the way up here to Scotland and most pieces were in place, everybody's visa was in place, that I realised I had this, a grin that I couldn't wipe off my face. So yes, I think I can say I'm excited. Flight of the Ospreys was presented and produced by Emily Knight. You can hear the next episode at the same time next week.